Hi, so today we will be discussing income taxation. But before that, may I just ask you if you know the essential difference between capital and income. Okay? So basically, capital is a fund and income is a flow. Capital is wealth while income is the service of wealth. Property for example, is a tree and income is the fruit. Labor is a tree and income is the fruit. So capital is a tree and income is always the fruit. So income means profits or gains. That is according to the case of Madrigal versus Rafferty. Income may be defined as the amount of money, coming to a person or corporation within a specified time, whether as payment for services, interest, or profit from investment. A mere advance in the value of property of a person or a corporation is no sense um, constitutes the income specified in the law. Such, um, such advance constitutes and can be treated merely as an increase in capital. And that is according to the case of Fisher versus Trinidad. Cash dividends is taxed as income because it has been realized or received, while stock dividends is not taxed as income because it is merely inquit as it is a mere anticipation of income and it becomes income once you sell it. One is an actual receipt of prof uh, profits. The other is a receipt of a representation of the increased value of the assets of a corporation. When dealing with money or property, the question you should ask are, is this capital or is this an income? Has it been realized or received or is it merely inquit? So, we'll now proceed with the general principles of income taxation. Okay, so the basic principles of taxation. Power to tax is inherent in sovereignty. The moment the state exists, the power to tax automatically exists. It is enforceable even without any delegation by the constitution or legislation from Congress. Remember that LGUs have no inherent power to tax, but is expressly granted by the Constitution or legislation. What do we mean by lifeblood theory according to CIR versus ALGE? So, tax is necessary to meet the expenses of government without which the latter cannot operate. So, if you are wondering kung ano pinangsisweldo sa mga kawani ng gobyerno, sa mga politicians, sa empleyado ng gobyerno, ito ay nanggagaling sa mga buwis or taxes na pinabayaran ng bawat isa sa atin. And that is why every person must contribute his share in the running of the government. I know some of you will ask, paano po yung mga hindi employed? Paano yung mga hindi nagtatrabaho? Paano po sila nakakapagbayad ng buwis? Okay? Malalaman natin sa mga susunod na discussions natin na hindi lamang income tax ang binabayaran ng bawat isa sa atin, kundi meron din dyan ng mga value-added tax, estate tax, real property tax, and everything. Pero ang magiging focus natin ay income taxation dahil yon ang subject natin. So what are the phases and scopes of taxation? We have levy where the Congress enacts a statute to impose taxes, collection, subject matter, which refers to persons, things, transaction, privilege, and etc. And the inherent limitations. Okay, so number one, taxation should be for public use. Public welfare should be the penultimate objective of the power to tax. Taxation may be used to implement the state's police power. Taxation is inherently legislative. 
the government is self-explanatory. LGUs are expressly prohibited from levying tax from the national government, okay? The national government may tax GOCCs, agencies, and instrumentalities. Number four is the territoriality, meaning the taxing authority cannot impose taxes on subjects beyond its territorial jurisdiction. It may also determine the tax situs. What are the constitutional limitations? So, the constitution is not the source of the taxing power. It simply defines and delimits the power to tax. Okay, take note of the due process clause in section 1, article 3 of the Philippine Constitution. Sabi dito, taxes are the enforced contribution from the people which cannot be made without a law authorizing the same. Another one is the substantive due process, which requires that the tax statute must be within the constitutional authority of the Congress and that it must be fair, just, and reasonable. The third one is procedural due process, which requires notice and hearing, or at least an opportunity to be heard. Okay. The second clause that you have to check is the Equal Protection Clause, Section 1, Article 3 of the 1987 Constitution, which means that the taxpayers of the same footing should be treated alike, both as to the privileges conferred as well as on obligations imposed. Third one is the freedom of religion, which is Section 5, Article 3 of the 1987 Constitution. You have to read the Non-Establishment Clause, okay, which covers the prohibition to establish a national or official religion, since in that case, there will be an appropriation from taxes paid by the people. The Free Exercise Clause, this is the basis of tax exemption granted to religious institutions. Fourth clause is the non-impairment of contracts, Section 10, Article 3 of the 1987 Constitution. It applies to people's right and freedom to contract. Sanctity of contracts does not apply to franchises and is not applicable to police power and eminent domain. Fifth is the non-imprisonment for non-payment of tax. Section 20, Article 3 of the 1987 Constitution. What do we mean by poll tax? It is the tax imposed on persons without any qualifications. Okay? The payment is not mandatory but merely permissive. Example of this poll tax is the cedula or the community tax certificate. The doctrine of equitable recoupment versus doctrine of set-off. Okay? Doctrine of Equitable Recoupment This refers to a case where the taxpayer has a claim for refund but he was not able to file a written claim due to the lapse of the prescription period within which to make a refund. The taxpayer is allowed to credit such refund to his existing tax liability and is allowed only in common law, uh, common law countries, not in the Philippines. The doctrine of set-off or compensation, which applies when the government and the taxpayer are mutually debtors and creditors of each other. This is also not allowed in the Philippines since taxes are not in the nature of contracts between parties. And taxes grow out of duty to and are the positive acts of the government to the making and enforcing of which the personal consent of the individual taxpayer is not Required, and this is according to the case of Republic versus Mabulao. What do we mean by double taxation? Double taxation is the imposition of the same taxing body of two taxes on one, on what is essentially the same thing. Again, double taxation is the imposition of the same taxing body of two taxes on what is essentially the same thing. The imposition of two taxes on the same property during the same period and for the same taxing purpose 
and it is allowed in the Philippines because there is no prohibition in the Constitution or any statute. statute. So, kailan hindi pinapayagan ang double taxation? Ito yung elements, ha? The taxes are levied by the same taxing authority. Same subject matter, same taxing period, and same purpose. In that case, double taxation is not allowed. Okay? How, how do we minimize the burden? What are the methods? Number one method is the granting of tax exemptions. Number two is by giving tax credits. And number three is by reducing the rate of tax. So, the exemption from real estate tax. You have to take note that the properties must be actually directly and exclusively used for religious, educational, and charitable purposes to be exempt from taxation. Kindly read Article 6, Section 28, Paragraph 3. So, Income Taxation or RA 8242, Tax Reform Act of 1997. So, here you have to classify the individuals. You have resident citizens who are the citizens of the Philippines residing therein. The citizens residing outside the Philippines without the intention of residing there at permanently. Ito yung mga OFWs. Okay? So, sila, Filipino citizen pa rin, pero wala sila sa Philippines at the moment. And they do not have the intention of residing sa ibang bansa permanently. Okay? So, may intention silang bumalik dito. And citizen who did not manifest to the total satisfaction of the commissioner the fact of his physical presence abroad with a definite intention to reside therein permanently. So, you have to classify the individual taxpayers. Number two, non-resident citizen. Kanina, resident citizens. Ito naman, non-resident citizens. These are the citizens who established to the satisfaction of the commissioner the fact of his um, physical presence abroad with a definite intention to reside therein. And the citizen who leaves the Philippines during the taxable year to reside abroad as immigrants. Ito yung mga immigrants sa ibang bansa, ha? Number three is the overseas contract workers or the OCW. This covers only those individuals with a working contract abroad. Okay, so the TNTs are not considered OCWs but are usually classified as resident citizens. What do we mean by TNTs? Ito yung mga um, illegal immigrants sa ibang bansa, yung mga Pilipinong walang papel na, na nagtatrabaho or naninirahan sa ibang bansa. Okay? Ang tawag doon, TNT, dahil tago ng tago. And they are not, again, considered as overseas contra um, contract workers, but rather classified as resident citizens. So, dito sila kailangan mag-tax. Number four ay resident alien. Um, a resident alien is an individual residing in the Philippines who is not a citizen thereof. Ito yung mga foreigners na dito nakatira. Pero hindi sila pa converted na uh, bilang isang Filipino citizen but rather they're still considered as aliens or foreigners or people na hindi citizen ng bansa kung saan sila um, nandoon. Okay? Okay, so their intention to reside in the Philippines is not necessary for as long as they're here. Okay, they're, they're considered as resident alien. Number five is non-resident alien engaged in trade or business in the Philippines. They're engaged in retail trade or business. Ito yung mga foreigners na pumupunta lamang dito para makipag-transact ng kanilang trade or business, okay? They are engaged in the exercise of profession therein. Yung mga foreigner na mga professors, engineers, and iba pang professionals na nandito para lamang i-exercise ang kanilang profession or magtrabaho dito. And staying for an aggregate period of more than 180 days for the calendar year. So, Kung ang total stay ng isang alien dito sa bansa natin ay more than 180 days, then they will be considered as non-resident alien engaged in trade or business in the Philippines. 
So, as you may have noticed, mere physical or body presence is enough. It is not the intention to make the country's once abode, and that is based on the case of Garrison versus the Court of Appeals. An alien actually present in the Philippines who is not a mere transient or sojourner is a resident of the Philippines for purposes of the income tax. Whether he is a transient or not is determined by his intentions with regard to the length and nature of his stay. A mere floating intention, indefinite, indefinite as to time, to return to another country is not sufficient to constitute, to constitute him as a transient. If he lives in the Philippines and has no definite intention as to his stay, he is a resident and one who comes to the Philippines for a definite purpose, which in its nature may be promptly accomplished, is a transient. But if his purpose is of such a nature that an extended stay may be necessary for its accomplishment and to that end the alien makes his home temporarily in the Philippines, he becomes a resident. Though it may be his intention at all times to return to his domicile abroad when the purpose for which he came has been consummated or abandoned. So what do we mean by a non-resident citizen okay it is um, one who is a citizen who establishes to the satisfaction of the commissioner the fact of his physical presence abroad with the definite intention to reside therein a citizen who leaves the philippines during the taxable year to reside abroad either as an immigrant or for employment on a permanent basis a citizen who works and derives from abroad and whose employment thereat requires him to be physically present abroad most of the time during the taxable year. A citizen who has been previously considered as non-resident citizen and who arrives in the Philippines at any time during the taxable year to reside permanently in the Philippines shall likewise be treated as a non-resident citizen for the taxable year in which he arrives in the Philippines with respect to his income derived from sources abroad until the date of his arrival in the Philippines. So who are non-resident citizens? Number one is an immigrant. Number two, permanent employee. And number three, contract worker. Who is an immigrant? It is one who leaves the Philippines to reside abroad as an immigrant for which a foreign visa has been secured. A permanent employee is one who leaves the Philippines to reside abroad for employment on a more or less permanent basis. A contract worker is one who leaves the Philippines on account of a contract of employment which is renewed from time to time under such circumstances as to require him to be physically present abroad most of the time and is not less than 180 three days okay non-resident citizens who are exempt from tax with respect to income derived from sources outside the philippines shall no longer be required to file information returns from sources outside the philippines the phrase most of the time shall mean that the said citizen shall have stayed abroad for at least 183 days in a taxable year the same exemption applies to an ocw but as such worker, the time spent abroad is not material for tax exemption purposes. All that is required is for the worker's employment contract to pass through and be registered with the POEA. Next is non-resident alien not engaged in trade of business in the Philippines. These are non-resident aliens aliens not engaged in business but are deriving their income in the philippines okay again these non-resident aliens are not engaged in business here in the philippines pero yung income nila na de derive dito sa philippines number seven i aliens employed in mnc's OBUs and Petroleum Service Contractors. Okay? What do we mean by MNC? 
dito sa Philippines, ang MNC ay multinational companies, multinational companies, offshore banking units, and petroleum service contractors. Next, punta naman tayo ng corporations. The NIRC or the National Internal Revenue Code defines a corporation as including partnerships, no matter how created or organized, joint stock companies, joint accounts, associations, insurance companies, and JV or the joint ventures formed for the purpose of undertaking construction projects or engaging in petroleum, coal, geothermal, and other energy operations pursuant to an agreement under a service contract with the government. What are the classification of corporations here in the Philippines? We have domestic corporations, resident foreign corporations, non-resident foreign corporations. Okay, tapos na tayo sa general principles. Punta naman tayo sa kinds of income taxes. Ano ang iba't ibang uri ng income taxes? We have net income tax, gross income tax, final income tax, minimum corporate income tax, improperly accumulated earnings tax, and optional corporate income tax. Okay, so for net income tax, ito yung magiging formula nyo. So, gross income less deductions, yung personal or additional deductions nyo, is equal to net income. So, net income multiplied by the tax rate is equal to net income tax payable. Okay, net income tax payable, less tax credits, dun yung makukuha yung net income tax due nyo. Okay? So, dati sa NIRC, nandun kung magkano yung tax rate. Pero dahil nga nagkaroon ng amendment sa ating NIRC at nagkaroon ng train law, please research about the current um, um, imposable tax sa atin, sa Pilipinas. Okay? I-research nyo yun. So, what is net income tax? So, this kind of income tax allows deduction, personal as well as additional exemptions, and tax credits. The determination of actual gain or loss is material since the tax should be based on the net. The rate of this tax is 32% for individual and 35% for corporate taxpayers. Dati ito. Okay, iba na ang rate ngayon dahil nga nagkaroon ng train law na amend yung ibang provisions ng NIRC. Unlike the net income tax, ang gross income tax naman does not allow deductions. Hence, the formula is gross income multiplied by the tax rate or imposable tax rate. And doon makukuha nyo yung tax due. So, the application of this tax bars the application of the income tax. The gross income tax is always subject to the final withholding tax. This is, um, ang final income tax naman ay ang um, only income tax applicable to all types of taxpayers without distinctions. The formula is gross income multiplied by the imposable tax rate equals tax due. Under final income tax, the rate is multiplied to each income individually as each income may have different rate. This tax does not allow deductions, and the determination of gain or loss is immaterial since the basis of taxation is the gross. Hence, actual gain or loss does not, does not matter. An income which is subject to final income tax is no longer subject to net income tax. Withholding agent is responsible in filing the income tax returns. Since sabi nga natin, ito ay subject sa withholding tax or final withholding tax. This is applicable only to passive income and income from sources within the Philippines. If the taxpayer fails to pay, then the withholding agent shall be liable. RA-10963 restructures the personal income tax schedule with separate schedules for compensation income earners, purely self-employed individuals, and or professionals whose gross sales or gross receipts and other non-operating income do not exceed the value-added tax threshold of 3 million and mixed income earners. So, dito sa unang table, sa taas, ito yung old tax schedule. 
based sa NIRC. Meron tayo ngayong new tax schedule effective January 1, 2018. Yan yung magiging tax rate. Okay? Yan. Tignan nyo. Mabuti yung difference. Ang susundin nyo na yung new tax schedule, hindi na yung old tax schedule. Okay. So, effective January 1, 2008. Yan yung tax rate. Pagdating ng January 1, 2023 and onwards, magbabago ulit yung tax rate imposable. Okay? So, wala pa namang January 2023. So, itong January 1, 2018 ang ating susun din. Tingnan nyo mabuti. Yan ay for compensation income earners. Iba pa itong nasa baba na for self-employed and professionals. So, iba't iba na yan. Hindi katulad sa NIRC dati. Next ay, ito, for mixed income earners. Again, effective January 1, 2018. Ito yung ating susundan. At hindi na rin yung nakalagay sa ating NIRC. Uh, mabuti na rin ma-memorize nyo itong table na to para alam nyo kung magkano or ilan ang imposable tax or ang tax rate na kailangan nyong i-impose sa isang tao base sa mga problems na ating tatalakayin at yun din yung magiging basis ng mga exams and quizzes nyo.